Hello and welcome to the Wade Baldwin the Fourth Show. I am Ben Weinrib. And I'm Allison Mast. This is our first show back from the 2015 spring semester, and we're hoping this is going to be a year of more national championships, more Johnny McCrary, and more Wade Baldwin the Fourth. <laughs> Uh, on today's show, we're going to bring you the wrap-up of, of our last football season before moving on to what's hopefully a better season with basketball. It's off to a good start, and we're going to wrap up the Auburn game from, last, or from Tuesday night to open SEC play. We're going to go to the whiteboard and then have our new favorite segment, DNA Slicing. Follow that up with our new favorite segment, Clever Basketball Chance. To wrap it up with ACS Tweet of the Week, one of our favorite recurring segments. Now, of course... Football season had ended uh, on sort of quietly. Uh, a lot of people were out of town for the Tennessee game. Vanderbilt ended up losing only by seven points this time, a lot closer than a lot of people thought. But there's, there's some hope for the future. Uh, Derek Mason likes to say that, especially now that he's fired both his offensive and defensive coordinators. I, of course, brought in Andy Ludwig from Wisconsin to be the offensive coordinator, and he'll be calling plays himself on defense. Um, so there, there will be changes about next year, but hopefully more to be excited about as that young team gets older. And absolutely, I think Andy Ludwig just shows his commitment to the program because you know he, that guy has 28 years of experience. He's coached at 13 different colleges. So you know, just bringing that and then taking control of the defense. And I heard he called plays during, against Tennessee, and our defense looked good in that game. So. With you know those changes and some s strong players returning, hopefully that'll be enough to turn this around. Yeah, as the NFL playoffs are starting to heat up, we see the Dallas Cowboys are marching out there with that great offense of Tony Romo, Demarcus, Demarco Murray, and Des Bryant. Vanderbilt may have their own little trio of that, and redshirt freshman Johnny McCrary, Ralph Webb, and C.J. Duncan. Not to put any undue pressure on any of them. Um, McCreary started uh, just about more than any other quarterback on Vanderbilt and has the tools to be that great quarterback we think he can be, but we're not really sure quite yet with this new offense who's going to be running at the helm. We saw Patton get in there at the end. Kyle Shermer's coming in. Of course, you know, the Nick Way Freeback, but what we do know is the running game will be strong again. Uh, we saw Andy Ludwig really succeed at Wisconsin. Uh, with Melvin Gordon, obviously, uh, Ralph Webb has a little ways to go before he becomes the Heisman finalist. But there are a lot of pieces there. They're about to bring in a new recruiting class. And going from a team that started a, a leading 31 freshmen, they're all a year older. Not really missing much next year on offense. They're losing Joe Townsend, uh, a very good center. But to return 10 guys on offense and 9 guys on defense, with the only two guys being Vince Taylor and uh, Kyle Westman, uh, it, things are going to be looking up. Yeah, you know, and we do have some vocal leaders leaving, like Kyle Westman, who's kind of been a face of the program the past few years, and Andrew East as well. So it'll be interesting to see who steps up and fills, you know, that void. Yeah, they're, the defense is sticking with sticking with a three-four. We're guessing probably Nephi Lalau is going to step up and be that big nose tackle, and hopefully he's up for the challenge there. But we saw just how many freshmen really stepped up, even the leading tackler. Nigel Bowden was a guy that a lot of people didn't expect to do well. By the end of the year, we saw Oren Burks, we saw Zach Cunningham, and we saw Jay Woods all playing really heavy minutes on defense. So there's really just a lot to look forward to. Again, the, the schedule is not going to be terribly hard. Of course, it becomes challenging if you're playing like a 3-9 and nine team, but uh, we've got no Temple this year. We've got Houston instead, so okay. dod bullet dodge there. Yeah. But... Um, yeah. Now, while we can hope for football to be better next year, basketball is already looking a whole lot better with the team starting off 11-3. and three. Um, We've seen all five freshmen are all playing heavy minutes with uh, seven of the eight rotation players being underclassmen, but they have really gone off to a good start. This is the best start since that 07-08 season when they won their first 16 games. But uh, what, what have you seen out of this team lately that you've liked? I think they've been really dynamic, which is comforting. They've had kind of a, a balance on offense that I like. All those freshmen are performing so well for their age and staying composed. Damian Jones is being Damian Jones. And for me, Riley Lachance has really been a surprise as well. You know, I know I, Matthew Fisher Davis came in being known as, you know, the pure shooter. But Riley Lachance has, you know, scored 26 points in a few games. 
So I've liked what I've seen out of him so far. Yeah, what's so fun about all these freshmen is they all have bring their own little unique thing. And I find myself basically wondering after every game, you know, which one of these guys is the best and which one's going to end up the best. Right now it really looks like Riley's the best because he's their second leading scorer. Mm -hmm. But you have Shelton Mitchell, who's this really athletic guy, ball handler. He's a little awkward with his shot at times. But you have Riley Chance, who's this great shooter, doing his best Rip Hamilton impression with that face mask right now after getting knocked in the face. You've got Wade Baldwin, who looks like a running back out there. And at, time, at the beginning of the year, it looked to me like he might be the best freshman. He's, uh, he's second on the team in three-point percentage. You've got Matthew Fisher Davis, who has looked a little tentative shooting, but looks like he can improve a lot. And Jeff Roberson, who looks like a defensive ball stopper. And uh, he's, they've, they've just all been so impressive. We sort of asked before the year, who's going to be the second best player? Mm -hmm. And all of the freshmen have really stepped up. Mm -hmm. And it's making this team look like it can really make, do damage in the SEC. And also some of our returners, too, kind of unexpectedly. I mean, we all knew Damian Jones would be the best player on the team, and he's definitely lived up to that. But James Siakam is someone who has been, you know, he's had a great few games the past few seasons, and has been really quiet in others. But I think he's definitely more aggressive in the paint. He's showed that he can score, he can rebound. And also, Luke Cornett, he has been taking three-point shots, which, you know, as a seven-footer, has makes some people nervous, but he has been making more in this season. It's actually leading the SEC in three-point field goal percentage for a while, yeah. which is kind of crazy. Yeah, you mentioned Siakam has been so good this year. He's leading the SEC in field goal percentage. This team is first also in field goal percentage. And what's probably most shocking is that they have four guys basically shooting 40% from three. They've got Luke Cornett at 43 and a half, and trailing right behind him is Wade Baldwin and rather the chance with Fisher Davis shooting at 39.6%. So we really haven't had any shooters in a really long time. Um, Dejan was a really good defender but never really developed into that shooter. Kedron obviously wasn't with the team last year, so it's nice to have be able to space out the floor mm -hmm. so they can't just double Damian down low. Now, uh, on Tuesday, as we mentioned, they opened the SEC play with a game against Auburn and won that one pretty handily, welcoming Bruce Pearl back to the SEC, good friend of the Commodores. Um, there was a lot of exciting plays there. Uh, a, a personal favorite of mine, Sheldon Mitchell, starting a fast break, kicking it out to Riley Chance, who sinks the three. Crowd goes wild. Uh, it was just some great ball movement there. Uh, something that stuck out to me after the game was that Bruce Pearl said that he saw three young players who reminded him of John Jenkins, Jeff Taylor, and Festus Azili. And he didn't name them specifically, but you could go ahead and guess that that was right of the chance as John Jenkins, Jeff Roberson as Jeff Taylor, and Damian Jones as a really good Festus Azili. But when you got a team this young, and you, you guess that most of them are going to stick around for the long haul, this is a team that could get good fast. Absolutely, and Stalin's kind of stressed Jeff Roberson's play in particular after that game in the press conference. He said, you know, he everyone has like that dude, I guess is what he called it, and he said like Damien usually is that dude, but in this case, in that night, Jeff Roberson was that dude just because his defense was so strong from start to finish. And frankly, uh, Stalin seemed startled that he could keep that up the entire game and really just sh kind of shut down the Auburn offense. Yeah. There's a lot of things that don't show up in the, in the box score, and that's what, something that Stallings has really pointed out. And if you remember, Jeff Taylor, back in his freshman year, wasn't a particularly great shooter, eventually developed into that guy. And if you look at John Jenkins versus Riley the Chance, Stallings has been a lot more willing to let Riley handle the ball himself, where John Jenkins is basically just a catch-and-shoot guy, which is fine, but it's nice to see uh, the freshman getting uh, a little more control there. All right, now we're going to send it over to the whiteboard now. Sam? Hi, guys. My name is Sam Wild, and today we're going at the very first to the whiteboard of the second semester. New semester, new sport. We're going to basketball. I'm tired of football, so I'm happy to be heading in this direction. On this week's episode, we're going to be looking at one of the classic plays in basketball, the old give and go, as I've so eloquently put up here. This time, Vanderbilt is going to put its own twist on it, and Kevin Stallings adds a little wrinkle to the average play. This situation, Commodore's already up big, 27-13, five minutes left in the first half, and this play puts a little exclamation point on this dominant first half for the Commodores with a James Siakam dunk off of a give-and-go. So on a regular give-and-go, what would happen, man with the ball would kick it out, and as soon as he kicks it out to his teammate, he would go right away, 
give, and he goes. In this case, however, Commodores add a wrinkle with a pick play using number four, Wade Baldwin. So James Siakam starts with the ball, passes it to Shelton Mitchell in the corner, and as soon as he does that, he starts running towards the hoop. His man would come with him, but number four, Wade Baldwin, gets in his way with a well-timed pick, leaving Siakam open towards the hole. Now, two ways to play the, play the pick is either you can stay with your man, where he's got to fight through the pick, or they can switch, meaning Baldwin's man would come with him. They tried sticking with him, but the pick really got him in the way. Baldwin's man stayed with Baldwin and really opened up Siakam for the wide open dunk with authority, ending the play. This gave the Commodores momentum and really put it in favor and opened the door for a huge game from James Siakam with 14 points in this, in this game, leading the way for the Commodores. The Commodores are going to have continued success through the season. They're going to have to have more plays to these towards their big men to continue the momentum and really get the Commodores on their way. This has been To the Whiteboard. I'm Sam Wild. Back to you guys at the desk. All right, so we are excited to bring to you guys our new favorite segment here, DNA Splicer. We have fired up the old DNA Splicer Raider 5000 to bring you four of the greatest athletes that Vanderbilt could bring you. Allison? Okay, we're going to start off with a combination of James Siakam and Luke Cornett. This one is probably my favorite. This would be my favorite athlete of all time, maybe. Because, you know, Luke Cornett, he has the size, obviously, seven feet tall, and he has the three-point shooting at times. But he really isn't as, aggress as aggressive as he could be, you know. He doesn't really box out when he rebounds. He kind of just puts his hands up and hopes that the ball lands in them. And Siakam, on the other hand, is kind of undersized, but he has that strength and that aggression inside the paint. So I think if you combine the two, you'd have this deadly inside player. Someone to finally match up with Damian down low. Yep. That would be, that would be a terror for sure. Uh, our second one out here is another terror, but not on the basketball court <laughs> in the ladies' hearts. We're going to splice together Andrew East and Shelby Motes for someone who is just a, a real lady killer. That's on the left there. Uh, that's uh, Sean Johnson, Celebrity Apprentice. Uh, extraordinaire. Sundays on NBC. Tune in. <laughs> and next we're going to spl splice together Damian Jones, Jordan Matthews, and Dansby Swanson to create this just three-sport god, really. And, I mean, can you imagine this, right? You have Damian Jones, who just destroys everyone in basketball, Jordan Matthews, who sets so many records in football, and then Dansby Swanson, who basically led our team to a national championship. Can you imagine if that one person could do all of that? I'm not going to say I haven't dreamt about this dozens of times, but uh, on to the next one. Our next one is going to be a splice together of Kevin Stallings and Shelby Motes to see back in the day maybe what Kevin Stallings looked like when he had hair. <laughs> I'd just like to imagine personally that Kevin Stallings just came out of the womb with a bald head and never grew hair there and I'm afraid to look like I'm, I'm afraid to imagine more than just that picture because I don't want to see I don't want to see Kevin songs with more hair than that I don't want to imagine he was a little kid that's like imagining when your grandparents were kids that's it's too bizarre just can't just can't wrap your mind around that one literally can't even now we are really excited to bring to you our new favorite segment <laughs> exciting basketball chance now, one of the exciting things about Auburn's team was they had a player with the last name Canada. And uh, us Americans don't take kindly to their taps around here. So, <laughs> every time he touched the ball, the crowd had a very exciting USA chant. Let's see what we got. USA! Now, of course, that kind of patriotic and smart thinking on our feet is not something you'll find at Auburn. That is something you will only find at the great Vanderbilt University. Um, you know, that is, that is just quality stuff. Uh, the crowd was going a little crazy. You know, it's Silvis week. All the students are finally back. SEC's back. Bruce Pearl's back. 
That might be peak crowd this year, actually, with Kentucky not coming back. Give your students an education, they'll give you some great chance. But frankly, I was kind of disappointed because I kind of I heard about these chants. I wasn't able to attend the game. I heard about these Canada chants, but I was really hoping that we'd kind of someone would break out and oh Canada, go that way. Not. I understand the USA. You want to be patriotic, but I feel like there was a missed opportunity there. We don't take kindly to that type around here. Canadians um, are nice, though, right? Yeah, but this is this is sports. This is tough. We take seriously and simpletons. Now the other chant we had going on was every time Shelby Motes came in and touched the ball in his minute of action, the crowd went wild, yelling "shoot!" And uh, I, I was extremely happy to see Shelby out on the court. He has been sort of buried on the depth chart after Stallings said that his practice and leadership had sort of forced him to give him a role this year. But unfortunately, Shelby did not shoot. And that was uh, one of the bigger letdowns of the game to me. And here at VU Sports Wired, you know, we, we have this, this shared emotion called Shelby Moat scored excited. It's just the purest form of happiness one experiences only when Shelby Moat shoots and scores. And so, you know, it's too bad that he didn't shoot, but nice to see that he's recovered from the concussion yeah. given oh, to him by Damien Jones. Yeah, I'm willing to forgive him uh, from robbing us from that experience. Uh, I wouldn't want to get hit in the head by Damian Jones. It doesn't sound particularly nice. But uh, now I guess we're going to wrap up the show with our, uh, one of our favorite recurring segments, uh, Austin Carter Samuels tweets. So Austin Carter Samuels has taken to Twitter again. Um, by the way, we want to congratulate him and Missouri on their season. I'm sure most of those wins were, uh, you know, the, the from the hard work of Austin Carter Samuels. But uh, during the... Tennessee game, he wanted to kind of encourage Vandy fans, so he tweeted, don't expect it, take it, hashtag Vandy, inspiring. That's stuff you can only get out of the great SEC East, <laughs> out to steal your girl in the bowl season. Well, that'll do it for us here, for Allison Mass, I'm Ben Weiner, and we will see you next week on the Wade Baldwin, The Fourth Show.